letter for the last days as we look at that background from June. Thanks, brother. To those who are called, wrapped in the love of God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace and love be lavished on you. What an extraordinarily lovely sentiment with which Jude commences his letter. And as we read such magnificent thoughts from the pen of Jude, we notice that there isn't any biographical information really to speak of. And so our mind no doubt swims with questions. Who was Jude? Why was he writing? And why did he write a letter like this? And to whom did he write it? And hopefully we'll answer some of those questions as we go along. As far as uh, piecing together the circumstances of this letter, we need to do a little detective work. And the amount of information that Jude gives us, which is a clue, is very scant indeed. He briefly introduces himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. And in this regard, he might be almost any of the first century believers. But he also makes a point of connection with James. And he introduces himself as the brother of James. Now, the James of whom Jude writes must have been sufficiently well known to the intended audience in the first place of this letter so as to make an association with him meaningful. There'd be no point writing to James if nobody knew who James was. Jude, on the other hand, must have felt sufficiently removed from his audience so as to feel the need of establishing his identity to those whom he wrote. So Jude uses the connection with James to establish his identity but his authority to write comes, as we'll see a little later, from the apostles themselves and of his being a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, without disintegrating into the kind of discussion where we might have strong words about which James it is that's intended here, I'm simply going to put it out there to you tonight, which James I believe it's to be, of the about five choices which we might have in Scripture. I believe it's James, the half-brother of the Lord, and the recognised elder of the Jerusalem Ecclesia, which is intended in this opening greeting. Now, Jude, on his part, refused to give us a clear hint of that. He doesn't say, Jude, the brother of Jesus Christ... It's almost as if the family connection that Jude shared with our Lord as his half-brother was unimportant to him. And I think in a very real sense, Jude would have felt that as the half-brother of the Lord, he was an unbeliever. And the Gospels tell us that. Neither did his brethren believe on him. In fact, on one occasion, they tried to have him arrested and put away. He was becoming an embarrassment. So Jude doesn't rest on a filial connection with Christ, but his connection is as a servant. And as a servant of Christ, he is no longer an unbeliever, but he believes. As an interesting aside to sort of corroborate that picture, the historian Hegesippus records that two grandsons of Jude were brought before the Emperor Domitian as descendants of a royal house and therefore as dangerous persons. But on demonstrating their poverty and on proving that Christ's kingdom is not of this world, they were contemptuously dismissed. While some crit critics would say that Hegesippus is flimsy and gossipy, this anecdote at least does give support to the notion of Jude being the half-brother of the Lord. And that, I guess, gives us our first insight uh, 
into the humility of the man. Jude is a very humble brother. It may not seem so from the forthright language he uses, but I suggest to you that if I were the half-brother of the Lord, it would be a very difficult temptation to resist some shameless name-dropping, as I wrote. Some self-aggrandizing reminiscences of when Jesus did this and we heard Jesus... Jude has none of that, does he? Not at all. He doesn't engage in anything of the kind. Even to the extent that we need to go to some effort to establish that there is a filial connection with Jesus. Now, as you can see on the screen, there are a number of verses in this letter which have a distinctly Christian flavour. That is, they have to do specifically with the hope which we have in Christ. There are also a number of verses in this little letter which peculiarly, peculiarly, it's a hard word to say after you've been singing, they have a Jewish flavour. And of course, James, that Jude said he's the brother of, had a particular association with the Jerusalem Ecclesia. So putting those three thoughts together, I submit to you that Jude is writing to Jewish believers in Christ at Jerusalem. Clearly then, Jude is not presently at Jerusalem. If he were, he wouldn't have written a letter he would have spoken to them as I am to you now. Presumably, Jude felt unable to travel back to Jerusalem. And we might surmise that Jude, with his family, fled Judea at the persecution which was instigated at the hands of Saul of Tarsus and recorded for us in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, where Saul made havoc of the ecclesia and dispersed them throughout all Judea and Samaria. Recent Judean events, I suggest, that our Lord predicted in Luke 21 would have made it difficult for Jude to feel that he could return. And he didn't want to go back to a place that Jesus encouraged the believers to flee from when they saw the city compassed with armies. So I suggest to you that Jude is writing not from Jerusalem, possibly many miles away, and he's writing back to the brethren and sisters in Jerusalem. For what does Jude get his authority and clout? Where does it come from? What we might just notice is that there's um, a distinct similarity. I don't know whether you noticed as Brother Simeon read it for us, that the second letter which Peter wrote and the letter which Jude wrote have a number of similarities. We won't go through all of the verses on that screen, but there are several more. The comparison of language is very similar, so much as to almost be identical. Almost every verse in Jude's letter, has had the force and the thrust of it borrowed from words from the Apostle Peter. It suggests that Jude felt he needed some apostolic support for his vigorous message. It is, after all, predominantly a message of judgment. And so I think Jude appeals to the second letter which Peter wrote as the most recent authority. And this, I think, is also instructive into how rapidly the apostolic letters were um, circulated and copied. I suggest to you that the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to Timothy, which we'll see has some allusions in Jude, in about AD 66. And the Apostle Peter probably wrote his letter in AD 67. And 
there are no quotes at all, no allusions, no references to any of the letters of John, which we would suggest are, are probably in the 85 to 92 bracket. Jude, on his part, um, is speaking to a, a Jewish audience, essentially, about divine judgment on the ungodly. And he uses a number of quite momentous judgments in the past on the Jewish people. And yet there is not a word of what happened to the Jews in Jerusalem in AD 70. It would seem then that Jude is probably written in about AD 68 or 69. So roughly 40 years between the warnings of Jesus of coming judgment in the Olivet Prophecy, many less years between the warnings of the apostles and coming apostasy. The language of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy and the language of the Apostle Peter in his second letter predict, predict and warn against apostasy. Uh, the speed of decline here that we notice is quite alarming. And I think the instruction here is to not sort of get lost with that, but to make sure that we don't match the speed of decline that the Ecclesia had in those last days. In 66, Paul wrote, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. In 67, Peter wrote, There shall be false teachers among you. And in 68, Jude wrote, There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Three years We've gone from it's coming to I can see it till it's here, said Jude. It's very stark, isn't it? Now the situation in Israel and the rest of the Roman Empire as far as the Jews were concerned had changed dramatically in recent years. The Jews had always been a troublesome nation for the Romans but now they were getting particularly aggressive towards their Roman overlords. There were lots of agitators and nationalistic revivals. As far as the Ecclesia are concerned, at Jerusalem, the Ecclesia had undergone significant persecution at the hands of Saul, and then the worst famine that Jerusalem and Judea had endured for some time, probably since Elijah's day. A war of independence had broken out against the Romans in AD 66. And it continued with daily skirmishes until it was brutally crushed in AD 70. And for someone living in Jerusalem, daily life was a terrible mixture of lawlessness of rebellion and violence. And it's into that scene that Jude pens these words. It emerges as we read Jude's letter that he appears to have been writing in response to what some commentators have called the Jewish plot. Having failed to eliminate the infant ecclesia, the saying, if you can't beat them, join them, I think held very true for the Jews. And so the Judaistic sect had tried to calculatedly undo the work of Christ by purposefully bringing in wrong doctrine, wrong teaching and practice into the ecclesia. And we know how this mixture of calamities would have affected the ecclesia because the Apostle Paul tells us of a similar but perhaps not quite so severe circumstance. He says, When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. 
without were fightings, within were fears. And if that circumstance troubled the Apostle Paul and the Ecclesia on every side, you can only imagine how things were as Jude's letter arrived. Verse 3 suggests to us that Jude was about to engage in the happy task of writing a letter of encouragement regarding our shared salvation. That was Jude's original purpose. Presumably, though, some troubling news of the circumstances in Jerusalem reached his ears and he felt unable to send the intended letter and no doubt impelled by the Spirit of God sent this one instead. The word needful in the Greek suggests necessity imposed by calamity. The New English translation has a wonderful clarity here. Dear friends, although I have been eager to write to you about our common salvation, I now feel compelled instead to encourage you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So what we have from Jude here in this letter was not the one he had originally intended to write. It was the one that he felt he had to write because of the circumstances which had encompassed the ecclesia. But before we consider those words, let's just take a small excursion back a little to consider the circumstances of Judaism and the Jewish plot. Because these circumstances underlay the problems that beset the ecclesia when Jude wrote. For hundreds, thousands of years, the Jews had lived under the law of Moses. Now we know, and scripture tells us, that the law was intended to bring them to Christ. Sadly, on the whole, they missed him. Yet when those who had not seen Christ in the law saw Christ at the hands of the apostles and the first century believers, when they heard the preaching of Jesus Christ and responded, one of two difficulties tended to beset them they either tended towards libertinism, well, we're not under the law, but under grace. Let us sin that grace may abound. And that was one problem which the the new Jewish converts were quite often faced with. Or else they rebounded and reverted to the comforting principles of the law. Legalism and law will save us was the other extreme to which they went. So on the one hand, there's this enormous swell of legalism that's popping up in the ecclesias. It wasn't the law as it was intended to be kept, but it was the law as the Jews now kept it. And you can see on the screen there just a sample of some of the passages where the apostles Peter and Paul had to contend with this legalistic spirit and the apostles felt obliged to speak out very strongly against Judaism wherever they saw it. But that didn't mean that the idea of license was what the apostles endorsed at all. Those who said, we now have liberty in Christ, it's do as you like, free to do whatever you want, the apostles spoke out very strongly against that. So there were these, if you like, divergent false teachings. On the one hand, there was Judaism, which was legalism, and the other hand, there was libertinism. And the apostles contended against these two false teachings very strongly. However, it's 68. Paul has died. Peter has died. We hear nothing of any of the other apostles. Only John is left, and we're not sure where he is. He may already be in exile. There aren't 
the strength of the apostles left to combat these errors and they're starting to spread rampant through the ecclesia. And many brothers and sisters were corrupted. It may be tempting for us to see that legalism is the opposite of license and one is good and, and one is bad. And so perhaps legalism might be seen as more desirable. Or else we see a spectrum with legalism at one end and liberty at the other. And somewhere in the middle, about where the fulcrum of the seesaw might sit, is the correct position, balanced between them. Unhappily, neither of those images is correct. Both legalism and license are divergent from the faith, as Jude rightly calls it, and their manifestations of the flesh. So what we have is the gospel, which is that green road down the middle of that screen. It's faith which works by love. And perverted out to either wing are Judaism and Libertinism. Liberty and legalism are not just an excess or other of one spirit. They're completely and entirely wrong. Now, there are freedoms which we enjoy in Christ, and there are principles and laws by which we must live in Christ. The true faith of Christ embraces both those things, but they are different and practiced with a very different spirit than either of the errors against which Jude wrote. And if some of you are sitting there thinking, well, I can't really see the difference, sounds all a bit the same to me, I think it highlights the point that it was easy to get sucked in by this. And you can be sure that the Jewish proponents made it sound like what they were teaching was gospel truth, when in fact it wasn't. But be sure of this, brothers and sisters, Judaistic legalism and licentious libertinism have nothing to do with Christ. Both of them are headed up by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 as a perverted gospel, which is not the gospel of Christ. The language of Paul in Galatians and the language of Jude here in his letter give us to understand that these wrong teachings that had infiltrated the ecclesia were not accidental. They were deliberate. The word in the Greek for crept in unawares is perhaps best translated by the English word infiltrate. That is, the motives of these false Jewish brethren were bad from the very beginning. To my knowledge, brothers and sisters, the brotherhood in modern times has not yet faced this challenge, and we fervently hope that we never shall. But let us not be naive and think that what has happened before will not happen again. It may well do. And if the warnings of Scripture are anything to go by, it may well do, may not be strong enough language. Might is perhaps too mild a word to use. So this letter which Jude writes is critical for us to take notice of. Now there are four key thoughts in this letter from Jude and each of them is repeated several times in just 25 verses. And these words combine together to give us a strong clue into the purpose of Jude's writing. He warned of judgment on the ungodly and encouraged those who followed Christ to preserve the truth, that they in turn might be preserved by God. And we're not going to stop now and consider the structure of Jude's letter in any detail but what we do want to notice is that there's a very Jewishness 
about the way in which Jude writes. There are 12 triplets of thought in his letter. It's quite a lot, isn't it? 25 verses and there are 12 triplets of thought and you can see them listed there on the screen. It's a very Jewish device to present your thoughts in groups of three and this would not be lost on his Jewish audience. Now, when one constructs an essay in English, there are some accepted points of structure which it is anticipated that you will conform. My essays, on the other hand, seem to have a beginning, a muddle and an ending. But really, there is supposed to be structure, not just in English, but in Hebrew as well. In Hebrew, the form is quite structured and very characteristic. What they do is they have a central theme and they reprise that symmetrically by other sub-themes. And it's a, a common device if you have a companion Bible at home, have a look at the Psalms and some of the prophecies in Isaiah and you'll see exactly what we mean. So, looking at the structure of Jude, the central theme is that C section, which you can see in red. And it's reprised symmetrically with sort of like a, a sideways pyramid, which leads your eye and your thought to that main theme. So, you can see that I've, I've endeavoured in this slide for you to, to colour code it. So, the two A sections in black uh, sit together. The two B sections in brown sit together. The C sections, likewise, in green. The D sections in blue. And they all lead to the central thought of judgment on the ungodly. It's a very Jewish structure. We mightn't have seen it, but we can be certain that Jude's audience did. So Jude now uses familiar structure, triplets, and particularly Jewish literary devices to bring home the message to his Jewish audience. The things that Jude writes about have no business being part of the ecclesia. No, he's not denying his Jewish roots, but Judaism and the rank growth of license have no place in the ecclesia. So Jude wants to appeal to his Jewish heritage and at the same time completely disown Judaism and immorality. The opening of the letter from Jude and the entire tenor of the language is helpful and it serves for us as a good model when we encounter difficulty. And the Brotherhood has been beset, beset with difficulties from time to time. Unhappily, we are inclined to be rather unbrotherly in our correspondence. The moment disagreement is evident. Oh, we start out our letter with the, the flattery bits at the beginning. Dear brother so-and-so, a thin veneer of fraternal love before we get to the nitty-gritty of the issue and things disintegrate quite quickly. There's none of that here in Jude. Listen again to the New English translation of verse 1. To those who are called, wrapped in the love of God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace and love be lavished on you. It's not vacuous flattery covering the malice of an angry brother. Jude is showing the sincere feeling that he has for him, for them rather. If it were in his power, they would receive those blessings which he asks God to bless them with. And so we need to realise that Jude is motivated by love and not by anger when he urges them to earnestly contend for the faith. Now, the English words earnestly contend are, in fact, one Greek word. 
And it only occurs in Scripture here. And, and almost nowhere else in classical Greek literature. It's therefore a challenging word for us to, to really put in a place and know exactly what it's talking about. But the other uses of this word in Greek literature refer to the Olympic Games and in particular the wrestling contests. This is a word for the arena in the Greek Games. So clearly when you earnestly contended with all of the, the force that this Greek word has there is going to be a victor and there is going to be a vanquished. Jude is not talking about conversion here. It's neither implied nor is it part of this process. The idea is overcoming an enemy who's in your arena. It's very pertinent to the background of Jude. And of course, if we're talking about the Greek games, there were rules, weren't there? You have to contend lawfully and there's an allusion to 2 Peter 2 verse 5 and we know that the Apostle Paul said you, you're not crowned except you strive lawfully. It won't do, brethren, for us to fight this fight in a way that the faith is denied. As much as it won't do for the faith to be vanquished. There was a need for Jude to urge them to contend for the faith because the ungodly had crept in and they needed to be wrestled out. Now the whole construct of this word in the wrestling and boxing of the Greek games implies it's not going to be an easy process. You don't climb into the arena and sit down and have tea and scones. You don't have a battle over a game of Scrabble. It's an agony and a struggle. Now, it might seem like semantics, but I believe that in the past, we've used this phrase in Jude to earnestly contend, perhaps in an improper sense. It's really only in the vaguest and most historical sense that those that constitute the Christian so-called churches about us, may be regarded as part of the ecclesia. In our experience, the church has never been part of the ecclesia. We don't need to wrestle them out because they were never in. True, we need to keep their ideas out and we need to speak strongly against their ideas, but applying the vigour that Jude intends here to those outside of Christ is hardly going to endear them to our cause, is it? Jude intends this struggle to be against those within who are corrupting the faith. When we preach, we represent the faith. We don't contend for it. When we represent Christ to those to whom we preach, if they don't hear, then we simply move on and preach to others. We don't normally need to oppose them in the way in which Jude speaks. But we don't take a compromising stand on our faith just because those who are error, in error are our brethren. Paul said in Galatians that we've already referred to, if I or an angel from God, were that even possible, spoke another gospel... Let us be accursed, he said. And he repeated it in case we missed it the first time. Sadly, it often becomes the case that blood is thicker than water and friendship stronger than truth. And we balk at speaking out against error. It must have pained Jude to write the words he did. To brethren... He dearly loved. But write them he did. We have a record of it. We can't dispute that. Jude is therefore anxious that we earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. And I think there's three thoughts in that phrase that we need to pick up on. 
He says, the faith. It's an expression that's found 42 times in our New Testament scriptures. It's not just faith. It is the faith with a definite article. The faith is specifically about the things of the gospel and therefore about the hope of Israel. Faith or belief is a generic word. You can have faith in almost anything. It's not just faith. It's the faith concerning which Jude writes. And it's been delivered to us. And we understand by that that it was never ours to begin with. The faith is of divine and not human origin. We might speak of the distinctive beliefs of the Christadelphians, but they constitute the faith of Christ and God. And we didn't invent our faith, and we are therefore not at liberty to tamper with it. We have rather been entrusted to preserve it. The gospel was delivered by Christ in his ministry, and then by the apostles in theirs, and from thence the message has been broadcast like seeds into fertile ground. And whoever responds thus have had the faith once delivered to the saints, delivered to them. But did you notice that the faith was only delivered once? It hasn't been re-delivered down through the ages of pockets of faith sprang up and flourished until the church shut them down again. It was not a new faith that Brother Thomas discovered. It is the one faith of Christ that was given originally by Christ and then at the hands of the apostles. We either have it or we don't perhaps the modern tendency to refine it or to improve upon it needs to be seen as suspect and questionable from the outset. Were Jude living in our times, what sort of a letter do you think he would write? Would he write to us of our shared salvation? Or would he looking at our ecclesias, be saddened that the teachings we accept amount to a denial of God and the practices we tolerate an abuse of his grace. Brothers and sisters and dear young people, it is the last days. There can be no doubting that we should. No better yet, we must uphold the faith. Not a counterfeit version of the faith couched in legalism or in license, but the faith once delivered to the saints. Let us be mindful of this sobering fact as we think on these thoughts to return to consider our Lord tomorrow as he is appointed. Thank you.